one of the reasons we're so happy that we have so many people from uh, from Canada is because most of the horses slaughtered in Canada come from the United States, but yet there's that contradiction. You know, the EU is not importing um, horse meat from Mexico because most of the horses come from here, but from Canada, because they are labeled Canada, somehow uh, they don't want to acknowledge it or whatever. Um, it's just, it's weird. And so we're going to have Lonnie Stewart, the Director of Administration and Research for the Canadian Horse Defense Coalition, to speak on this. And she has very graciously um, gotten a letter. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But those of you who know who Alex Adapanenko is, he is the NDP and MP for the British, um, for BC Southern Interior. And he had uh, introduced a bill last year that failed to ban horse slaughter in Canada. And what he wrote was, and I'm not going to read this whole thing, I regret that I'm unable to gather with you today, but appreciate having the opportunity to say a few words in support of this very important movement. The slaughter of horses, whether it is for human consumption or to facilitate some other human convenience, must be brought to an end. I know there was much disappointment last year when Canada's parliament failed to pass my bill, C-571, which would have closed our border to U.S. horses destined for slaughter in my country. On October 19th, Election Day, Canadians will head to the polls and choose a brand new federal government. Also on that day, I will be retiring and my time in politics will come to an end. These next months leading up to voting day will be an important time for activists in electoral districts across Canada to actively engage candidates seeking to represent them. Constituents must make it clear to candidates that votes depend on making a commitment to saving horses. It is my greatest hope Canada's next parliament will be made up of members with the capacity and will to change our laws in the treatment of horses. I certainly will be making sure that my successor is brought fully up to speed. May hope and optimism guide this summit and the onward march toward the in inevitable day when horses are freed from the predatory actions of mankind. So that is amazing. So with great pleasure, I introduce Lonnie Stewart. Okay, so good morning, everybody. Um, today's presentation is called The Horse Industry in Canada. Yes, yeah, so it's called The Horse Industry in Canada today, or as I call it, The Gong Show. This time, there won't be any gory pictures, but I'm going to dodge around a bit from on topics uh, just because it's not, horse slaughter is just not logical, and neither is the presentation. Anyway, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Also, well, it's not. It doesn't make sense. Also, please note that each slide is numbered in the lower right-hand corner, so if you have a question, just note the slide number, and then we can get back to it. Cool. Okay, so that's me. That was my old horse. He was a thoroughbred. He passed away in 1983, and I still miss him dearly. Yeah, that's me then, and that's me today. <laughs> so a little overview of the Canadian Horse Defense Coalition. We're all volunteer. We formed in 2003, but we registered as a nonprofit in 2009. We cannot be a charity because uh, the Canadian Revenue Agency says that we're a little bit too political for their liking, so we can't do that. Our mandate is to ban all horse slaughter as well as the live exports of horses for same. Uh, we, we're doing this through education, investigations, exposés, and shows and conferences such as this. We believe, the CHDC believes, that horses are a companion animal and a working partner, not a commodity or a food item. In Canada, the horse slaughter industry is governed by the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, which falls under Health Canada. In 2011, the CFIA made changes to various aspects of their operations, and the changes that affected horse slaughter were the implementation of designated border crossings, as, as seen on this map, and also the hours of work for CFIA staff at the plants and crossings. Employees can only work regular business hours, Monday to Friday, which means that horses can only cross the border at those times and can only be received at the plants during those hours, too. And we've seen trucks sitting on the side of the road overnight 
waiting to go to Quebec in Canada. More recently, the CFIA has been under fire. They've been under fire for the amount of cutbacks to their inspections in Alberta, which is where the Bouvry equine slaughter plant is located. On April 30th, the Minister of Health, Rona Ambrose, under who the CFIA reports, said in Parliament that she's sending inspectors to inspect the inspectors. Roll video, please. Rona Ambrose is dispatching a unit of senior food inspectors to Brooks, Alberta. We've even created a team of inspectors to inspect the inspectors to make sure they're doing their jobs. And I'm going to send them in to make sure everything is okay. We have inspectors, but now we don't trust the inspectors, so we'll get inspectors yeah, to inspect the inspectors. Just in case. And keep your eye on Mal keep your eye on Alan Malcolm. Also making the news as well is that the huge cattle slaughter plant in Brooks, Alberta, has also failed miserably in their latest inspections, which is a major concern for the safety of meat leaving this plant and for global customers. If the Canadian government cannot ensure the safety of meat for human consumption from the mega-huge beef industry, then what attention can one expect with the very small horse meat industry? The safety of the meat industry in Canada is indeed questionable. Incidentally, in one case of contaminated meat from the Brooks plant, it was the USDA who informed the CFIA about the problem. Then, the USDA did an inspection and said that the CFIA was okay. Not great, but okay. And here's Malcolm Allen again. On May 17, 2014, as Alex's um, letter said, the Canadian Parliament voted on Bill C-571, which had which would have virtually ended horse slaughter in Canada. In Canada, the Conservative Party have a majority, have had a majority for eight years, but support is waning, as we saw with uh, Alberta. Yes. The bill had been brought forward by MP Alex Adamanenko, who was a member of the NDP party. One would think that a party would support their members, but Malcolm Allen, NDP ag critic, the MP you just saw in the video, convinced some of the NDP party not to support Bill C-571, by quoting the GAO report, thereby placing doubt in the minds of the few NDPers who voted against the bill. Now, the Liberal Party, who we think will likely get in, uh, they almost to a, an MP voted for the bill. So if they get back in, we've got a good chance of going forward with, it, with another bill. One of the N NDP MPs who voted against the bill has the LPN plant in her constituency, and her name is Mylene Freeman. And that's a little standard bread that was killed there. She said in Parliament just before the bill was voted on that the LPN plant employs 70 people and is very important to the town of St. Andre d'Avelin, which has a population of about 4,000. 70 people represents 1.75% of the population of the town, hardly a major employer. In 2010, Bill C-544 was the first anti-slaughter bill tabled in Canada's Parliament. Because an election was called, the bill was not presented for a vote. And if you think that industry doesn't try to protect their interests, this is a letter that was confidentially sent by Claude Bouvry to all of the members of Parliament for him, saying that how bad the bill was for him and his company. In the letter, Mr. Bouvry tries to reassure MPs that the horses processed at his plant are raised for that purpose. All of the, us here know that the vast majority of horses going to the Bouvry plant are from local auctions like these horses unloading at the plant from the Drayton Valley auction in Alberta. This was in October of 2012 and this of course is the Shelby feedlot. You can see a green tag on that one and that one. Most of the horses leaving Shelby don't appear to have the tags on them. And all of the horses in these videos were fine, healthy horses who could have had bright futures. And these guys are at Shelby as well, or were. <laughs> Okay, so that's another video. At these border crossings, the load is checked at the border crossings we mentioned before. This is a video. 
um, by the CFIA visually and paperwork matched. At some busy crossings like this one at Sweetgrass, Montana, the horses are unloaded into a shed for examination. Because of the high volume crossing here to the Bouvry plant, apparently this building was constructed only for this purpose. <laughs> and once they're cleared, a seal is put on the trailer that should only be cut by the CFIA inspector at the plant during regular business hours, but it can be broken in an emergency, although drivers, oddly enough, sometimes ignore downed horses in their trailer. I know that's a shock, everybody. The CFIA has allowed border inspectors to not unload horses at some crossings for examination, saying instead that they can get a ladder and climb up and look into the trailer to match horses to the documentation. Now, this would undoubtedly be difficult on dark or rainy days. And this is the Champlain border crossing into Canada. This crossing does not unload horses and was frequently used in 2014 by Leroy Baker, likely due to the ease of getting through. The horse slaughter industry in Canada has seen a marked growth in recent years, mainly due to the U.S. horse slaughter plants having been closed since 2007. Because of this, exports for slaughter to Canada and Mexico increased. It was hoped that the EU ban on Mexican horse meat would see a substantial decrease in U.S. exports to Mexico, but it doesn't appear so. Before the ban, U.S. horses already comprised an average of 55.2% of the hor horses slaughtered in Canada. Unfortunately, we expect to see these numbers grow. In late November of 2014, the European-based animal welfare group Tierschutzbund Zurich, who has worked closely with Animals Angels and the CHDC, presented the FVO office of the EU with video evidence of the atrocities inflicted upon horses in the North and South America who were caught in the slaughter pipeline. This evidence, along with the results of their own audits of slaughter plants and the pipeline in general, led to the EU ban on, the Mex on Mexican horse meat being imported to the EU as of January 2015. We know that this won't stop U.S. horses from being shipped to Mexico, as Mexico has other markets, maybe not as large as the EU, but other markets just the same. Also at the same time, there was mention about stricter conditions to the so-called six-month rule in Canada. To our knowledge, there haven't been any restrictions on, put on horse meat exported from Canada, so the trade appears to continue on unabated. The EU, EU had conducted another set of audits to the Canadian slaughter plants and industry of May of, in May of 2014. The CHDC submitted an access to information request to the CFIA requesting the draft audit report from these inspections. The CFIA responded with the usual heavily redacted document that had 38 pages withheld and a whole lot of nothing on the few pages that were sent through. The CHDC also submitted an ATI in 2011, yes, 2011, asking for information regarding the slaughter industry in general. The CFAA has consistently delayed getting any documents to us, and they are known in the country for being the one government department that doesn't want to tell anybody anything. What little we have received had references to an audit the EU did in 2010 that showed the Canadian slaughter plants were lacking in all areas. We can only assume that the EU found that in 2014 not much had improved. One thing that came out of the 2010 audit is that the Bouvry plant commenced an expansion in 2011, likely due to the outdated conditions noted in the audit. That area with the um, fluorescent lighting, that's all new. Mr. Bouvry said in an interview that the plant expansion was due to a growing market. We're still combing through this one file, which is 1,900 pages out of a larger one of over 30,000. Which we, haven't, which we haven't got yet. And there's Claude Bouvry right there with the blue hat. I think that's the only picture I have ever seen of him. I, I don't know why he's not out there more often, but... <laughs> the statistics here show the total numbers of horses slaughtered in Canada to February 2015's month end. We don't have March and April yet. 
January 2015 was down 9.1% over last year. However, February saw an increase of 3.6%. We do know that the CFIA and others are always pushing the horse slaughter industry when talking trade agreements with other countries. Why they keep pushing this industry is a mystery as horse slaughter only generates 90 million or less a year for those in the industry. And as you can see, for 2014, $78 million. And it's a safe bet that it costs the Canadian taxpayer millions to prop it up and keep it going. The live horse industry, on the other hand, in Canada, generates about $9 billion into the economy, something that the government and pro-slaughter interests don't seem to want to acknowledge. In early 2011, there was news about Equine Canada joining a delegation to China, supposedly to promote various equestrian disciplines to China's new middle and upper class. This included mention of Agriculture Canada participation, from who Equine Canada received over $50,000 in grants in 2013-24's year end for them. This could be a reach out to expand horse meat sales to China, as well as a workaround solution to the EU regulations, as no such rules exist in China. What's also concerning is that the Canadian Thoroughbred Horse Society was also involved. Earlier inside information received from within the CTHS showed that they hoped to work around the EU rules by reaching out to China to keep the slaughter solution available for Canadian thoroughbred racehorses. In preparing the presentation, I came across a blog from someone based in China regarding the Beijing Jockey Club with photos of horses at the club. I see a lot of bony stuff there. This chart was created by Heather Clemenceau in 2014 and shows the horse slaughter enablers at that time both in Canada and the US. It's available on Heather's blog and is a great overview of who's who, but I've got to get her to update it this year. <laughs> because there been, have been a few changes. I just threw that in because it's uh, just to let you know that it's out there. We're all aware of the various breed associations that look upon slaughter as an easy disposal system, even if they don't say it publicly. One that does is the Canadian Belgian Horse Association, who has a link to the slaughter rules for horses in Canada on their website. And speaking of Belgians, the gentle giants. As we all know, the PMU industry started suffering blows against it in the early 2000s. The farmers likely knew that their days were numbered and were looking for ways to remain profitable. Meanwhile, and this is going to get confusing, so please try and follow along, even I have trouble. Meanwhile, in Yelm, Washington, the Shorno Agri Business Group had been live shipping draft horses to Japan for several years, enjoying profits from this industry. Around the same time, the BSE scandal hit Canada, leaving beef producers hard hit. Among them, Bouvry Exports, who were given close to a half million dollars by the Alberta government in compensation for BSE losses incurred during a one-year time frame. And after that, Bouvry started going heavily into killing horses. Also at this time, the Summerview feedlot in Alberta came up for sale, which is not too far from Fort McLeod, which is where the Bouvry slaughter plant is. And for years, most of us thought that the Bouvry exports actually owned the Summerview plant, but back in 2003, it was bought by Shorno Agribusiness of Yelm, Washington. Because Shorno used to be shipping the drafts out of Seattle Airport with uh, FedEx, of all people. And for whatever reason, they stopped. Um, I used to be in the airline industry, and I heard that the FedEx pilots just refused to do the shipments anymore. Most of them did, so they wouldn't bid on the job. So, Okay, so then, up until 2006, the property was always listed as being owned by Shorno, but then it appeared as a numbered company. Much digging eventually revealed that the name behind the numbered company for, for the Summerview feedlot was Glen Shorno. In 2012, a local map still showed the Shorno name on it. However, by 2014, the numbered company was showing. As we saw in the letter that Mr. Bouvry wrote to the MPs, life on the feedlots is a dream come true for horses. As Mr. Bouvry said, conditions are idyllic. Large open spaces and grain, but no shelter from the elements and no apparent easy access to water. 
Here the horses are enjoying a fine meal of some sort of grain mixture meant to put on weight quickly. Vet care is lacking if at all present. Usually if a horse is down when they go out there in the morning they just shoot them. He has impaction colic. She was delivering a stillborn foal. No, this is not the same air. This is several years ago. This shows you that it's just endemic. It keeps on going. It doesn't change. And the Alberta SPCA goes out there and says, mm, yeah, well, you know, it's a feedlot. That was heartbreaking to see them nose to nose. I was looking at Susan's beautiful Belgians and their beautiful feet. And this is what the feedlot horses stand on and ship on. And here, this Percheron in the feedlot is getting some positive human interaction with an investigator, but that'll be the last time for kind words and gentle pats on the nose. The obvious question is, where, what are the horses warehoused for and where, are, where do they come from? Most people have assumed that they're destined for the Bouvry plant, but it's not the case. They're at the feedlots to be live shipped to Japan to be slaughtered there. Remember Shorno? For whatever reason, Shorno shifted operations to Alberta and has an apparent working relationship with Bouvry exports to supply the product. The horses are warehoused on the large feedlots for a year or two, depending on their age. Please start video then move to the Summerview feedlot, which is a CFIA-approved quarantine station as, and is approved to hold 4,500 horses on it. Paul Littlewood, the regional director and chief inspector for the CFIA in southern Alberta, said in an email to one of our directors that, and I quote, allowing the horses to travel together is often desirable and meets the intent of these other sections. This commonly occurs with draft horses which already know each other and would therefore experience less stress during transport if they are able to interact socially. Since these horses are social animals that prefer to travel with other horses, CFIA staff routinely assess the stature and demeanor of animals intended to be transported together to determine if they are compatible. The CFIA verifies that the animals which are incompatible by nature, regardless of their height, are segregated. This video showing horses being loaded for the trip to Calgary Airport shows that this is not the case at all, oddly enough. Do they really think that anyone is going to take the time to ensure that all of the horses like each other before loading? <laughs> oh, you ain't seen nothing yet. At the airport, they're loaded usually three or even four, as seen here in wooden crates for the very long journey to Japan. According to Mr. Littlewood, these crates measure nine and a half feet by seven feet for floor space and 7.6 feet high, much smaller than an average box stall, and they're squeezing three and four Belgians and Persians into them. Apparently, the height of the crates has been increased to allow more headroom. The crates can't get any higher due to the height restrictions of the aircraft type being used. These crates are so tight that if a horse does go down, there's nothing that will be done for that horse for the duration of the journey, which can easily be up to 36 hours or longer. 36 hours is allowed in Canada. The regulations in Canada state that any horse over 14.1 hands must be shipped separately by air.
After being loaded into the crates, they're usually taken outside to sit on the ramp frequently for many hours in all kinds of weather being taken to the aircraft. And this is airside at the airport, jet, jet airplanes taxiing by, de-icing, it's crazy. This Cargo Lux airplane is being de-iced. Cargo Lux carries horse meat from the brewery plant to Europe. The icing fluid is toxic, but the horses here are being exposed to it with no concern for their safety. They're just going to die anyway, right? The CFIA's responsibility ends once the aircraft is wheel wheels up. The carrier that's doing these charters now is Atlas Air Cargo of Purchase, New York, seen here at Calgary Airport. Upon arrival in Japan, they're loaded directly onto trucks while the crates are dismantled and discarded. You can see that a mare was likely in this crate. Imagine being held in one of these for two or even three, with two or even three other horses for possibly 36 hours or more, no food, no water. Here we see horses being encouraged out of the crates. This is the first footage out of Japan, by the way. And these horses are being shunted around in the crate on the skyjack, jostling them even more. This truck passing by is taking another load to the quarantine station. The quarantine station is a low concrete bunker near the airport. In 2014, 7,116 horses took this journey, which was up 7.2% over 2013. And that's that for them. So, hmm? over last year, last year it was 7,116. So where do they come from? In an ATI document, the CFIA stated that the supply of horses for Japan via the PMU industry was drying up. And we know that auctions supply at least some of them as video, <laughs> as indicated by this Belgian who has a braid in his forelock. This is an Amish Mennonite custom to have a horse appear more appealing at auction. His eyes are obviously a concern, but veterinary care on the feedlots is virtually non-existent. And according to the same ATI document, a horse such as this beauty would have been rejected for the live shipments due to the eyes and would have been killed at the Bouvry plant. And I did see drafts going through the, uh, the slaughter line at Bouvry. Many are likely from former PMU breeders who now could be breeding for this market. We do know that the Hutterites, who are an offshoot of the Amish Mennonites, are also involved in the breeding of drafts for the Japan market. So it appears that the supply is sadly being met. The EID system. As we know, the EID system is in place to satisfy EU requirements. We've seen over and over and over again that the CID system is filled with lies, errors, and omissions. In the footage received by the CHDC from the LPN plant, a large number of actual EIDs were photographed. Of the 62 EIDs photographed, 28 were from Sugar Creek, signed off by Leroy. 20 were signed off by Steve Landfor, Landfair. 11 were signed off by former Quebec-based kill buyer J.P. Soucy, and three appear to be signed by owners bringing their horses directly to the plant. Shockingly, the EIDs filled out by the kill buyers had the greatest instances of apparent fraudulent information. <laughs> this EID was completed by a woman who apparently brought her companion horse, who she had for all of her life, directly to the plant. I had hid her name at one time, and now I thought, screw you. <laughs> okay, in this example, an EID has been completed supposedly for an 18-year-old mare who was deemed a workhorse. 
The EID accompanied the mayor who was presented at the LPN plant in July of 2011. She had been brought in with a load from Sugar Creek. In the circled area, the EID shows the following information. The horse is owned by one person, but the EID is signed off by someone else. The person signing checked the phone number not available, but the dealer's phone number was written in, so there's no trace back to the original owner. The addra address cannot be verified. The drug section has been altered, with a large X saying no drugs within the past six months. However, there's obvious white tape over the yes. Her age, sex, and height have also been altered. The document states that she was a workhorse, but she has the appearance of a fine show horse. Now, this should answer a question that came up earlier. The EU has apparently been satisfied with the EID system so far, but as mentioned previously, we don't know what the future holds. Certainly, they've had to have seen all of the evidence showing the fraud behind this seriously lacking system. Now, how is the EU not knowing or ignoring the fact that the horse meat coming from Canada to the EU is primarily, primarily from U.S. horses. That's because Canada has very lax labeling laws. Anything can be labeled product of Canada if the ingredients have been assembled in Canada. I'm sorry that, you know, to call the horses ingredients, but that's how the, work, the, the law works. So once the horses are signed over to the plant, they become Canadian, which enables Canada to circumvent labeling laws which are very lax and fool the EU. Those are boxes of frozen horse meat at the Bouvery plant. So after seeing all of this, is it any wonder that so many end up in the pipeline like Backstreet Bully, Cactus Cafe and Kanuki, and of course... Fred. <laughs> With such sloppy record-keeping and outright fraud, so many disappear into the pipeline, as we all know, never to be seen again, such as Susie and Echo Johnson. And this standard-bred mare, shown at Natural Valley Farms, which was in Saskatchewan and was shut down in 2009 after an expose from the CHDC, but they said it was for food safety concerns. Her name was J.N. Ashley, and she died on April 28, 2008, her 15th birthday. And there's so many thousands more anonymous soul, souls. Now we're going to get into a subject that I'm really not strong on, and I had to work quickly to get this together, and it's on the Alberta wild horses. In Canada, there is a very small population of wild horses that are termed feral. The situation regarding these wild horses is pretty much a mirror image to what's being dealt with here in the U.S. with the BLM, the ranchers, etc. Government wants to get rid of them, and advocates are fighting to save them. One group fighting to save them is the Wild Horse Society of Alberta, which was formed, obviously, to help them. The majority of wild horses are in Alberta, with a few small bands in British Columbia, likely the result of native bands and outfitters turning their horses loose to wander, and this is likely what's happened in Alberta, too, because they have a, you know, they'll just turn a horse loose when the horse is of no more use. The free horses in Alberta are ruled over by the Alberta Environment and Sustainable Resource Department, or ESRD, who classify horses as feral, which has them falling under the Stray Animals Act of Alberta, which enables the culls to take place. Their 2014 survey count showed less than 1,000, which is not nearly enough to claim that they're damaging the environment. So truly wild or not, that's a big question. Um, that got bigger when a group were captured in February 2014. Three mayors from that group who were believed to be in full, not surprisingly, ended up at the Bouvery plant. Let's listen in on a horse supporter calling the Bouvery plant for info on the three mayors. A little audio, please. You've reached the voicemail of Bryce Melvin in the buyer's office at Blue Free Exports. I am presently unavailable to take your call at this time. For immediate assistance, please select extension 8, and Brandon will be able to assist.
don't like answering their phone. Don't know why. Hi there. Uh, my name's Christine. I'm wondering who I would speak to regarding three horses that were brought in from Sundry this week. What do you want to know about them? Well, I'd just like to know if they're still there. Can they be bought back? They came sometime this week? I'm not exactly sure the exact day they came this, this week, but they came from Sundry. Yeah, if they came in this week, they'll already be processed. Um, even if they're pregnant mares? The question raised, whoa, was that these horses, these mares, would have had no traceability if an EID had even been filled out for them, as it appears they were taken directly from the sundry capture directly to the plant. So, apparently they tried to condemn the carcasses and get them taken out. I, I didn't have time to follow up on the story. Anyway, uh, boovery. In November of 2014, WOES, the Wild Horses of Alberta Society, entered into an agreement called a Memorandum of Understanding with the ESRD. This document is a five-year agreement that allows WOES to work in collaboration with the ESRD to humanely manage wild horse populations in the Sundry Equine Zone. Not the others, but just Sundry. How will this be achieved? The first is the PZP contraception program, where a limited number of wild mares will be selected each year to receive this vaccine. The second strategy is an adoption program. There are so many aspects to the wild horse issue that it would take its own presentation. So I, I'm going to have to leave it at that because, I, and plus I just don't know a lot. If you, if you need more information, you can always contact Woes. Now I know a lot of this material has been tough to go through, but I'll leave you with this one final thought. I like big foots and I cannot lie. You get sprung. Wanna pull up tough? Cause you notice that butt was stuck. Deep in the jeans she's wearing. I'm hooked and I can't stop staring. Oh, baby, I wanna get whipped up. And take your big time. Wonderful.